Some aircraft never leave the drawing board. Others never make it past the mock-up stage. Still others are flown, but never go into production. And finally, airplanes are designed, built, flown, successful in service, pioneering in their own ways. And yet all these aircraft that we just talked about have one thing in common. Not one survives intact anywhere in the world today. And we're gonna bring you 30 different aircraft that are now called extinct species in this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Let's start with the X-planes of the late 40s and early 1950s. These were exotic designs, uh, unique in some cases, one of a kind aircraft that were uh, only for one purpose and that was research, uh, exploring speeds and altitudes and flight regimes, uh, different configurations, it was just an amazing time of exploration and uh, progress in aviation uh, after World War II. But what's really amazing is that all the airplanes you see in this photo still exist to this day in museums and other venues. From lower left, the X-1A series, although the, the 1A in particular was lost in an accident, but the advanced Bell X-1 series uh, does survive. Uh, next, the Douglas Sky Streak, the one-of-a-kind Convair XF-92A, the uh, variable geometry Bell X-5, the Douglas Skyrocket, first airplane to Mach 2, the X-4 Bantam at lower right, and in the center, the X-3 Stiletto. As dangerous as these flights were and as uh, risky as these missions were, all these airplanes survived. But let's look at 30 different designs that didn't. And we're going to start with the proposals for the uh, strategic bomber at the beginning of the Cold War. Now, to get right to it, this was the winner of that whole process, the Boeing B-47. Uh, Boeing test pilot Tex Johnston considered this one of the most significant airplanes ever designed. It was the uh, great grandfather of literally every uh, jet transport uh, flying today. 35 degrees swept back wing, potted engines, advanced uh, construction techniques, a revolutionary airplane, 600 mile per hour bomber in 1947. But let's look at the uh, designs that didn't make it. These were the competitors and these were straight wing airplanes. And so they just didn't have anywhere near the performance. Let's start with the consolidated XB-46, the Martin XB-48, the Martin XB-51, and uh, this is an overview tonight. I'm, I'm not going to be getting into all the political stories and reasons. We'd have an hour long video if I did that. But uh, this is, as I say, an overview of the airplanes that were designed and built and flown, but never survived. The Curtis XP-87 was actually an interceptor design. Uh, the uh, Northrop uh, F-89 Scorpion uh, won this contract, but uh, this was the last airplane that Curtis built. Uh, we talked about the Republic XR-12 Rainbow. This is a photo recon prototype. Uh, two were built and competed uh, for an Air Force contract with the Hughes XF-11. Uh, in both cases, one prototype was lost in an accident and the other was uh, scrapped. So none of these airplanes survived. And why weren't these machines saved if they were so rare and so unique? Well, the short answer is that the Air Force Museum and other uh, military museums hadn't been established yet when these airplanes were flown and, uh, and then came to the end of their uh, service life. So although the roots of the Air Force Museum go back to 1923, uh, it was essentially a storage facility after World War II. It opened to the public in 1955, and the current facility that's at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, as you see here, opened in 1971. So the answer was other than uh, Davis Monthan Air Force Base, which is the boneyard, there really was no facility for preserving or saving any of those airplanes. And that uh, led to the scrapping of all these different machines. Now there were uh, differences. Uh, here you have the Converse Sea Dart. Four were built, three were flown, two survived and they're in museums today. But then you had 12 Martin XP6M and P6M Seamasters the world's uh, fastest uh, flying boat, uh, a nearly 600 mile an hour airplane, 
a revolutionary machine, uh, but it was a water-based flying boat powered by four jet engines. And yet the Navy's strategic bomber mission uh, gave, it was given to the Air Force. And there's a whole political story with that. And all 12 Martin Seamasters were scrapped. The Navy had ideas of getting into the uh, troop transport business as well. And here you have the Convair trade wind, but uh, it was powered by the uh, problematic uh, Allison T-40 turboprops with contra-rotating propellers. And that uh, was really the Achilles heel of the airplane. And uh, 11 were built uh, and they were all scrapped. Same with the Lockheed Constitution, two prototypes were built. And again, this was when the Navy uh, had visions of large troop transports. Uh, something uh, different in the performance realm, the Grumman XF-10F Jaguar, which was an experimental airplane to test variable geometry wings on a carrier-based airplane. It was kind of a tubby design and uh, again, just a prototype. Uh, two were built, both were scrapped, but it led to a very interesting airplane, Grumman's F-111B, which was the Navy version of the uh, F-111 series in 1962. And uh, this was not suitable for carrier operations. It was just too large, but Grumman came back and uh, hit it out of the park with the F-14 Tomcat, one of the greatest naval fighters ever. And here you see it with the wings extended. And here's the F-14 with the wings swept back. So sometimes a prototype that's not successful leads to, ultimately leads to airplanes that are. Speaking of flyoff competitions, the Vought XF-8U3 Super Crusader or Crusader 3 uh, was the Navy's fastest single engine airplane at Mach 2.39, but it competed against the uh, McDonald F-4 Phantom, which ultimately uh, won the uh, contract and uh, more than 5,000 of those airplanes were built. But the Crusader 3 was an amazing looking airplane and three prototypes were built and flown and none were saved, they were all scrapped. Looking at airplanes from foreign lands, we have uh, one of the most elegant, one of the most beautiful machines ever flown, the Avro Canada CF-105 Arrow, which was gonna be a Cold War interceptor. A number of airplanes were completed and were flown in Canada. And uh, due to some very uh, interesting political uh, maneuvering, uh, the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force did not go with the airplane. Uh, Bomark missiles were substituted and the CF-104 uh, Starfighter from Lockheed was built uh, under license. So the CF-105 was not to be. From Great Britain, you had the world's largest airliner after World War II, really the first wide body airliner. Um, and that's the Bristol Brabazon. Uh, but it was too much airplane for the market at that time. And so the one, uh, one of a kind prototype was, was scrapped. All right, show of hands, how many of you built a Ravel Ferry Rotodyne kit that you see here? You ever seen a picture of the real one? There it is. It was a one of a kind uh, hybrid helicopter turboprop commuter. And the whole point was to go from city center to city center uh, without having to go out to an airport and get on an airplane and uh, go through that whole process. Uh, it, it, flies, it flew successfully. Uh, but it was extremely loud and very expensive to operate. And so the one-of-a-kind prototype was scrapped, although parts of it existed in uh, museums in uh, Great Britain. The Saunders Row Princess flying boat, a huge uh, transport flying boat like the Brabazon, just too much airplane at the time. Two were built and both were scrapped. Now we get to a very interesting airplane, the de Havilland DH-108 Swallow. Uh, this uh, is believed to be Europe's first supersonic airplane in a dive. Three were built, and sadly, all three were lost in accidents that claimed the lives of their pilots. But the most notable uh, was the uh, prototype that uh, was lost in a dive at Mach uh, 0 0.9, and it was flown by Jeffrey de Havilland Jr., the son of Jeffrey de Havilland, the founder of the company. Uh, what's interesting is the date of this accident was September 27th, 1946. Ten years later to the day, on September 27, 1956, the second of two Bell X-2 rocket airplanes crashed at Edwards, claiming the life of uh, Captain Mel Apt. 
And it just goes to show that with a total of five of these research airplanes and the loss of all five, with uh, the loss of five pilots, uh, the flight test uh, business in those days was, was uh, pretty dangerous and pretty risky. But what came out of it was knowledge and progress uh, in aviation in later years. The flying wings are, uh, uh, you know, deserving of, of special uh, consideration in this uh, topic. And let's take a look. The XB-35 uh, flew uh, just before the end of World War II. Contra-rotating propellers. The YB-35 was the uh, single propeller version uh, of the flying wing. Wingspan was 172.0 feet, the same exact wingspan of the B-2 stealth bomber today. Uh, the YB-49 was a jet conversion of the B-35. And the YRB-49, with the additional two engines slung uh, under the wing and pods there, was the, was the uh, reconnaissance and ELIND version of the airplane. It was ahead of its time. But uh, all the flying wings that were built were scrapped at Hawthorne, at the plant uh, where they were constructed, and sadly, by the same people who built the machines. The consolidated uh, B-32 Dominator uh, flew at the end of World War II. It was used in the Pacific. 113 of these airplanes were uh, constructed. It was kind of a backup to the B-29. And uh, it did uh, fly in service. And all of all the uh, B-32s were scrapped. The XB-19, the Hemisphere Bomber, built by Douglas in Santa Monica, the world's largest airplane at the time. One of a kind prototype that you see here in uh, Hangar One at Santa Monica. Here it is at March Air Force Base. Uh, it held uh, a lot of promise for a, a giant army bomber, but it was again, just too, too big and uh, uh, just not as, as advanced and developed. The Boeing B-17 took the role. And obviously that was a classic in World War II. Douglas DC-5, 12 of these were built. It was the DC-3 replacement. Uh, it didn't go into mass production because of the beginning of the World War II, but all 12 were uh, wound up being scrapped. The Douglas C-74, the first Globemaster with the uh, twin bug eye canopy here. This airplane was used in the Berlin airlift and uh, 14 of these were built and all were uh, subsequently scrapped. But it led to the C-124 Globemaster II and ultimately the C-17 Globemaster III. And now we come to the flying boats. And for me personally, as a historian, this is the most amazing part of this story. And so I'm gonna wind up with a look at all the Pan Am uh, flying boats that were used from the uh, uh, early and mid 1930s, uh, uh, well into the late 1940s. And let's take a look at some of these machines. They re revolutionized air travel. It uh, opened up the Pacific and ultimately the Atlantic to uh, airline travel. We started with the uh, Consolidated Commodore, the Sikorsky S-40, which uh, opened up routes to South America, the Sikorsky S-42 used in the Pacific, and of course the famed uh, Martin M-130, the famed China Clipper, three of these were built, and the Boeing 314, the Yankee Clipper seen here, which uh, flew across the Atlantic from LaGuardia Airport in New York to uh, points in Europe an amazing airplane, 12 of these were built. All of these flying boats were either lost in accidents, sank, or were scrapped. Not one survives to this day. So there you have it, a look at more than 30 different aircraft uh, that were flown, uh, some successfully in service, but not one airframe exists in the world to this day. Thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. And I'd like to dedicate this program to the memory of John K. Lewis. Uh, John Lewis uh, worked for me when I had Wings and uh, Air Power Magazine. He was an Air Force pilot and a uh, corporate pilot uh, and a, a wonderful airman. And uh, the extinct species idea was uh, his concept. And I wanted to honor that in this program. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And until next time, Take care.